But at the end, uh, our uh, very uh, our uh, speaker uh, Balog István has arrived. Uh, István Balog is deputy state secretary. Uh, he's, uh, has, uh, he has uh, finished uh, the university uh, of the Corvinus University, and uh, today he works uh, at the uh, Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, since uh, 2018. I give the floor to István Balog. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. Um, I'm really honored to be here today, uh, especially in this uh, very inspiring uh, environment. Um, uh, in the way of an introduction, please allow me to provide you with a brief overview of uh, what I wish to cover in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, first of all, I will provide you with a short summary of uh, our basic philosophy when it comes to enlargement, and uh, a large section of that will be devoted to the Western Balkans. Uh, as uh, the overwhelming majority of the candidate countries and potential candidate countries uh, come from that part of the world, belong to that part of the world. The second topic I wish to uh, go into in more detail uh, is a list of the main political arguments uh, for enlargement. And I think all of these can be derived from uh, the key principles that I will list in, my, in the first part of my presentation. And of course, I wish to um, uh, sum up my presentation uh, with a brief overview of the future perspectives for, for enlargement. So moving on to the first big section of, uh, of uh, uh, my presentation, uh, our general philosophy. Um, and of course, I'm sure a number of these have been elaborated today already uh, in brief uh, during the keynote uh, section or keynote speeches. Uh, but I will go into some of them in more uh, detail. And of course, before I move on to the specifics, let me just say that we, uh, we perfectly agree and sympathize with the basic mindset behind this conference. Uh, and there are two issues that I would like to highlight. Number one is a, a discussion on enlargement within the context of the future of Europe. Because it is our assessment that um, uh, the Western Balkans has a future in the European Union. They are already part of Europe, so it's only natural to talk about this within the context of the future of Europe. Um, and I do certainly think that given the, the, the title of this panel, namely uh, enlargement as it relates to the future success or the success of, the, uh, of Europe and the European Union, again, it's something we, we absolutely sympathize with uh, because we believe uh, that it is indeed one of the most successful policies of the European Union. Uh, and in order to maintain that, in order to uh, make the European uh, Union successful, we need an effective uh, uh, and uh, functional enlargement uh, policy. Uh, which leads me basically to the list of principles that would sum up our philosophy uh, uh, and, and the way we approach uh, the policy of enlargement. Essentially, the list of uh, principles would begin with uh, uh, what I have already touched upon, namely that enlargement is historically probably, uh, it's definitely one of the most successful policies of the European Union, but it is probably one of the most, uh, it's probably the most successful external policies of the European Union. Uh, and we believe that uh, this trend needs to be maintained, especially now that we need success stories uh, and also given the fact that we are now post-Brexit. Um, uh, it is our firm conviction that enlargement has to be a political uh, process. And the reason I am highlighting this is because increasingly we are experiencing that the process in a number of European capitals is perceived to be more of a bureaucratic one. Uh, and we feel that uh, this is the wrong approach as it risks uh, losing sight of our strategic goals, e.g., for example, a, a more geopolitical European Union. So we need to be able to think a little bit like NATO, where a number of key uh, enlargement rounds were not completed necessarily because the candidate countries represented enormous and effective military power. 
but because a political decision was made that the strategic benefits of accepting these countries into the alliance outweigh the costs. Now, of course, the European Union is a completely different organization uh, from NATO. Uh, we know that, we accept that, but still, um, I think we need to uh, adapt, uh, adopt a similar mindset. Now, of course, this does not diminish the importance of enlargement uh, being a merit-based process. It goes without saying. But if we allow the process to become one of just ticking boxes, then we lose sight of our long-term goals. Number three, um, instead of talking about the Western Balkans and the leaders of the Western Balkans, we need to be talking to them in order to tackle the challenges of the region. Uh, we feel that this is the only way to tackle uh, the problems experienced uh, uh, in the area, and um, we need to talk to all the local stakeholders. Um, uh, I could point out a number of cases in, uh, in point, but I think this applies to the whole region in general. Uh, principle number four. Um, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that we need the Western Balkans more than they need us. Uh, and this is because of some of the key challenges that the European Union is ex experiencing. Uh, and a lot of that is connected to the region of the Western Balkans. Um, uh, for example, the security of uh, Europe and the security of the Western Balkans is absolutely indivisible. Um, and that uh, is related to uh, effective tackling of illegal migration and other threats. And these suppose the integration uh, of the region into the European Union. The European Union also needs economic success stories, especially after um, the social and economic effects of the pandemic uh, situation. So an expansion of the single market down towards south would be uh, uh, one of those uh, potential success stories. Um, number five, we need to speed up the process and tackle the obstacles in the way of opening chapters um, with Serbia, closing chapters with Montenegro, and opening accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia. Uh, one of the risks we're looking at um, if we, if we uh, do not do, uh, uh, as I just uh, mentioned, is that we risk losing um, the political support of those political elites who are investing into painful reforms, but then again, not being able to show the political results uh, uh, and positive developments to their own voters. And therefore, uh, we risk uh, losing their pro-EU orientation. And, and this is something we should be avoiding at all costs. Um, number six, uh, we need to be focusing on infrastructural development of these countries in order to physically connect them to our region. This is the best way of creating everyday benefits for the citizens uh, of the region. Thus, we are very supportive of the Commission's um, economic uh, investment package for the Western Balkans, uh, as it does indeed uh, reflect this general approach. Um, number seven, uh, any solution aiming at the stabilization of the Western Balkans should be found within the framework of EU enlargement. Uh, we believe that solutions outside of that uh, can only bring temporary uh, and only partial results. Therefore, we should have uh, a concrete results uh, on the tracks that I mentioned uh, and uh, the four countries I had specifically mentioned still this year. Um, and number eight, uh, the European security archi architecture will never be complete without the Western Balkans. Um, and I'll come to speak a little bit about uh, the specific uh, reasons for that in the next um, um, section, which is about the main political arguments for um, enlargement. We certainly feel that the viability of the uh, enlargement policy is, is a litmus test for the success of the European Union. And that is because if the EU cannot fulfill its role in the Western Balkans in a credible manner, it will lose ground uh, and it will lose um, its credibility 
uh, that will send a very negative message, not also in the region, but in the international arena in a general sense. Uh, and I mentioned that we need success stories. We've had Brexit. We've had the social and economic impacts uh, of COVID-19. We have multiple um, political debates within the European Union uh, that lead to unnecessary um, divisions. So therefore, again, enlargement uh, would be uh, a natural way of producing success stories. Uh, we also believe that enlargement is also investment into long-term peace, security, and uh, prosperity. Uh, and it is our firm conviction that the next decades are going to be the decades of illegal migration and multiple waves of different pandemics. Uh, and when you look at the Western Balkans, both of those strategic challenges could be found over there. The Western Balkans is one of the, the main uh, transition routes for uh, illegal migration towards Europe. Uh, and we've all seen how interconnected we are because of COVID-19. Uh, uh, and, and this is why it's so important to also help the region uh, in order to demonstrate our solidarity. So one of the key political arguments, I would say, is the security argument. But let me uh, go into more detail on that. Um, if we allow our attention to be distracted then I think we should not be surprised that destabilizing trends uh, start emerging in the region. And I think it is crucial that we do not repeat the mistakes of the 90s when the EU was unable to tackle security problems in its own backyard. Uh, now, recent developments in Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina clearly underscored the need for maintaining high-level um, political attention. And of course, the Western Balkans is uh, the EU's gateway to the southeast and a major migra uh, migratory route, as I highlighted earlier. Um, if we do not engage in capacity building already, regardless of these countries' aspirations to become members, then again, uh, we will allow certain strategic challenges uh, to be uh, even more uh, pressing uh, in certain ways. Uh, capacity building for building institutions, capacity building for effective uh, protection uh, of borders, among others. There's also, I think, another security-related aspect that we talk a lot about within both NATO and the European Union, which is um, hybrid tools being used by certain actors uh, in the region, and our sort of natural response to that is always that, okay, um, but we should not be surprised. We should not be surprised. International politics is a competitive arena, uh, and what our response should be to enter this competition with all of our assets, tools, and resources in order to signal that, hey, we're here uh, in this race, and we are competitive if we really want to be, if there is political unity and political willingness to do so. Um, and of course, the best way to tackle these challenges is, is an adoption of the acquis communautaire, because that will sort of, uh, in a natural way, uh, um, tackle uh, uh, these uh, problems. And another security-related issue that I want to uh, point out um, uh, is what I already mentioned, which is the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis. Um, and we have a saying in Hungarian that sounds something like this in English, he who provides help quickly helps twice. Uh, it's actually some of the few say sayings that sound also good in English, not only in Hungarian. Uh, and so according to this principle, Hungary has made sure that we provided um, equipment uh, for these countries in order to fight COVID. Uh, protective wear, face masks, um, vaccines, among many other um, uh, uh, tools in order to help fight the pandemic, because we had felt that, uh, first of all, it's a question of solidarity, but it's also a question of linkage. Uh, we are already intertwined, uh, and whatever happens from the point of view of, uh, of COVID in the region will necessarily have an impact and inevitably have an impact on on our part of the world uh, as well. Now, 
this brings me to um, the social and economic perspective of enlargement. Uh, one of the key aspects uh, of this question is, is youth. Um, uh, and uh, for an enlargement policy that is losing its dynamism and, and credibility, uh, we think that it would be very difficult to win over uh, the youth of the Western Balkans to the idea of European integration. Um, uh, and in terms of the economic aspect, um, I think the fact that an expansion of access to new rail and road connections and infrastructure towards the Aegean uh, and the Eastern Mediterranean regions, besides new markets that I had already mentioned, as well as the potential for giving momentum to economic growth within the EU, are crucial economic reasons uh, to speed up uh, the process of um, uh, enlargement. Now, of course, the optimal strategy for Western Balkan countries is to do their best in preparation to accession and, uh, and uh, engage in the implementation of reforms. Again, I'm repeating that enlargement is a merit-based process. But wherever we are seeing the signs of success in terms of implementation of reforms, we immediately should be providing positive feedback to those countries. Um, and sometimes we are seeing a lack of that. Uh, acknowledgement and recognition of the efforts that have been, uh, that have been um, implemented and taken so far. Now let me move over briefly to some of the country-specific arguments. Um, uh, we feel that Belgrade has showed great dedication and progress uh, regarding uh, the necessary reforms. And we feel that clusters and at least one cluster should be opened by the end of the year uh, because it would add to the, the credibility of the accession process after a um, considerable uh, period of stagnation, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have to say. In the case of Montenegro, um, uh, there are certain uh, factors that slowed down uh, the process, uh, but I think we should do our utmost to keep the momentum and continue closing chapters. Um, uh, also, North Macedonia and Albania, um, in those cases, uh, starting uh, accession talks is long overdue. Um, I think uh, we should have uh, started this process uh, much earlier on. We know that the end of the year is approaching fast. Still, we have our hopes that there could be um, some sort of a, a positive progress. Now, in closing, and of course there are many dimensions that I didn't touch upon, maybe we can um, touch those uh, during the Q&A session or the closing uh, part of the conference, but I think that the EU cannot be called a truly geopolitical actor if it cannot uh, take uh, as its members at least one or two countries in the near future from the Western Balkans. So I think the stakes are much larger than the, just the the state, status of reforms in individual candidate countries. And of course, let us be honest, we know that there are varying degrees of enthusiasm for enlargement in different corners of the European Union. Uh, and of course, there are two ends of the spectrum. Uh, Hungary clearly belongs to the group of countries who are heav heavily pro-enlargement. But there are other uh, convictions within uh, the European Union. Thus, I think we need to focus on two tracks in a parallel manner. Number one, we need to engage in the serious business of trying to foster a stronger political consensus within the European Union for enlargement. Out in the public and openly, there isn't an EU member state who will not support enlargement. So we're not talking about just public statements. We're talking about honest, wholehearted, political support for the process, because we feel that sometimes we're lacking that. And of course, the other one uh, has to be the maintenance of interest of, well, of the Western Balkan countries in investing into reforms. So that's sort of the external track. We have a domestic EU track, and there's an external aspect that we must focus on. Um, for example, uh, in, for certain candidate, country, candidate countries, we have identified that technically a number of chapters and even clusters are ready to be opened, technically. Still, uh, there is no green light from the European Union. 
Why is there not? This is why I'm saying that uh, we need to have a stronger uh, political willingness to carry on with the process. Now, if we cannot do both, then I think that the EU cannot call itself a geopolitical actor. Um, thus, we sincerely hope that um, uh, uh, progress can be made still this year. We have uh, only a few weeks left until Christmas, but uh, uh, we feel that uh, we still need to um, uh, focus on uh, what we can do in the remaining uh, window of opportunity. Um, thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. It's an honor to be here again, and I'm happy to respond to whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much. <laughs>